stage is yours. Fist bump. Hi, giant hall of people. <laughs> um, it's very exciting for me to be here. It's my third time speaking at WordCamp Europe. It's one of the highlights of my year coming. It's really fun. So I hope you guys are enjoying. I'm glad I got you before lunch, so you're not in the post-lunch coma state, um, because we're going to be talking about something that you'll either find really interesting, I find it interesting, or really boring, and you'll take the opportunity to have a good nap, which is fine. I'll try not to disturb you. <laughs> so a little bit about me. So I'm from Israel, as you mentioned. And did you guys watch Eurovision? I'm not your toy, you silly boy. I just had to put that in. Um, I founded a web development agency about 12 years ago. Um, we provide high-level business solutions uh, using WordPress. Been writing a blog called WP Garage. Uh, we kind of stopped writing on it, which is a shame. I miss blogging. But people still tell me sometimes that they're looking for a tool or a solution to something related to WordPress, and they'll come across our tutorials that we've written there. Five-time WordCamp organizer, but then WordCamp Central implemented um, a new regulation where you can only delete organizer twice, and I had passed that <laughs> by far. So uh, yeah, looking forward to hopefully having another one there soon. And if, if it happens, you guys should come. And more recently, the founder of a startup related to WordPress called Stratic. We um, are a static site publisher for WordPress and other CMSs. Um, and by publishing them as static, we basically solve all issues related to performance, speed, and security. All right. Oh, right. And also, <laughs> I can't forget that. I'm a mom to seven. <laughs> so <laughs> there's my loves of my life, my children. <laughs> Each one of those is another startup. Anyways, so we're going to talk about content security policies today. But first, let's just talk about how the average web page loads in your browser. So when you visit a web page or your web page loads in someone's browser, it's accessing or calling um, different assets or resources of different types. And many of them will be resources that are on your server um, on the same domain. And some of them will be third-party services, or a lot of them will be third-party services. Here's just an example from a very well-known large news site. These are some examples of the types of assets that it's calling when you load their home page, and they're not assets that they own. They're third-party assets from Bounce Exchange, Adobe, you know, things like that. How are web, web apps or websites compromised? So either it's on the server side, which is what I think us in the community are most familiar with. Um, the vast majority of vulnerabilities and hacks happen on the server. And that's when our sites get defaced or just don't work anymore and things like that. The other way that sites get compromised is on the client side. So that's um, the user in the browser. And the most prevalent type of attack, both server side and client side, is cross-site scripting. Um, and cross-site scripting is when a hacker or an attacker tries to inject uh, their own script into your site, into your source code, and have it loaded in the browser. Um, so, yeah, so that's cross-site scripting. It either can originate on the server or it can originate um, on the client side. Once this attacker has this type of privilege or has gotten into that state in your page source and in the browser, it has the same privileges as your browser in general, which means it has access to your cookies, to your web storage, to your DOM, and that's not a very good situation to be in. There's three types of cross-site cross scripting attacks. Persistent, which means it's related to the server. Uh, it originates in the database. One example that used to be much more common but has been basically stopped is when someone leaves a comment, and the comment has some kind of script in there that will then be loaded. The other is reflected, which um, it originates in the victim's request. So that means someone gets a URL in an email or whatever, and that URL has some parameters in it that load a script. So they think they're loading, they're clicking on a, an OK site, but they don't notice that the URL is not OK. And then there's DOM-based, which means that it has nothing to do with the server side. It has everything to do with what's happening on the client side. Cross-site scripting has been in the OWASP top 10 threats since OWASP started talking and having this list, this annual list of the threats. Uh, OWASP is the open source uh, collaborative security information um, and guidelines uh, uh, resource. It's very useful. 
So with cross-site scripting, um, even though sometimes it originates on the server, the, the victim is not your site. The goal isn't to deface your site or take it down. The goal is to attack your users, your visitors to your site, and get certain types of information from them. What they can get when they do a cross-site scripting attack is session hijacking, cookie theft, account takeover, redirecting traffic, stealing account credentials, right? Um, they can see what people are uh, typing in, so that's key logging, which I'm going to get to, displaying unwanted ads, infections, it's not pretty. Um, an example of this that happened relatively recently that was quite widespread was the Browse Aloud attack. I don't know if you guys heard of it, but Browse Aloud is an accessibility extension that many sites run in order to make their sites more accessible. In particular, um, government websites, many sites in the UK and in Europe. Um, they access this extension by adding a line of script to their page source. And what the attackers did was they got access to the library that these sites were, at, were calling or referring to, modified it, turned it into crypto mining. So everyone who visited these government sites, that script was now using that user's resources, their laptop, their electricity, their CPU, to mine for cryptocurrency. Um, mining for cryptocurrency isn't like the worst thing that can happen to a user. It's annoying. But the fact that that was possible shows what, could po what potentially terrible things could happen when we're depending on third-party services. Um, so the, the Browse Aloud extension runs on like 5,000 sites, and that's how many sites were affected. So in one go, they just made one change, and it was across the board on 5,000 sites. In general, crypto jacking, thanks to the rise of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and their rising prices, not so much anymore, um, it led to a lot of efforts by hackers to utilize or gain access to people's user resources in order to mine for cryptocurrency for their own gain, and that is called crypto jacking. Um, a very popular one is called CoinHive, and people use it for legitimate purposes. Well, kind of. So there's like one site called Salon, and because of ad blockers and the difficulty in monetizing sites, they, Salon said to their users, either pay us some kind of fee or we're going to have this coin hive running. So when you're reading our site, we're actually using your resources to mine for Bitcoin or I think it was Monero actually. And then, you know, that's how we monetize. But in many cases, it's not legitimate. Either the site owner is not telling the user that that's what's happening or the site owner themselves don't have any clue that their site has been infected and their site is now grabbing resources from all of their visitors. What happens when you have a crypto jacking attack? Slower devices, it can use up to 100% of your CPU. I don't know about you guys, but I have way too many browser tabs open. I'm already like at 80%. All I need is some crypto jacking to happen and my computer will just fry itself. Um, high energy consumption, battery drain, and overheating. Crypto jacking has infected 55% of organizations in the world, that's the estimate, and it's increased 8,500% over the duration of 2017. That's what greed does. And in browser, crypto jacking increased 34,000% also over the course of 2017. So it's crazy. So how do we protect ourselves? Oh, it's just one example that affected the WordPress community actually is um, this plugin. So this is a weather widget, which is pretty innocent. And you know, all it does is help website owners display weather in an easy fashion. The plugin developer didn't realize that the, the um, source of the weather data that they were using had been, was, was uh, implementing crypto mining in their iframe. So anyone who was using their service was crypto jacking their users. And so this plugin was actually removed from the WordPress repository. So how do we protect ourselves, in particular our website visitors, from these types of third party attacks? We think we control our web pages and yet we don't because we're relying on a lot of other resources and other parties um, to generate our web pages. So what content security policies do is they whitelist resources. It allows you, the site owner, to whitelist the resources that you want the browser to load for your web page. So rather than trying to guess what the bad stuff is, you just say this is the good stuff and this is what I want to load. Um, it's been in existence for like, I think two years. Um, 
and I'm going to tell you how to use it. Very few people are using it. So this is just like an example of, of what happens. So here's a web page, and it has content security policy in its header. It told the browser, and the browser knows, okay, Google Fonts is okay to load, Google Analytics is okay to load, and that image is okay, but here's an evil JavaScript. The content security policy knows that that's not included in the whitelist and doesn't allow it to load at all. It can't even get going. In terms of browser support levels, so content security policies in the beginning and even maybe until a year ago did not have widespread browser support. So that meant that you could only protect your users if they were using certain browsers. Um, the thing is that even if you, your visitors are using a browser that's not supported, there's nothing negative about that. Uh, it just will ignore it. So it's not like there's a detrimental effect here. In browsers that are supported, then the content security policy will get, go into action. So how is a content security policy built? It has two parts to it. One is the directives. So basically, you have a list of types of assets that you can refer to. So font source is fonts, right? Frame source has to do with iframes. Images, images. So you're saying these images or the, these fonts, this is what I want you to do or not do with them. And then there's the source expressions. So we say font source, and then we can give it certain parameters. So we can say font source only from this website. Or in the case of, let's say, frames, you may say frame source none. There should no, be no iframes loading in my site, um, even from my own server, because you know, your server could be compromised and you just know that there will never be iframes that you want to be loaded on your site. Iframes are sometimes used for um, click jacking attacks. Self means my website URL is mysite.com. So any assets coming from mysite.com slash whatever, that is okay. Star is everything. And unsafe inline and unsafe eval are two ways that the content security policy allows us to continue to have bad behavior. And I'll explain what I mean. So the point of content security policies is that we separate structure from behavior. So I don't know how long you guys have been in the world of web development, but when I started, we built our pages using tables, <laughs> and our styles were inline, which is bad practice. And obviously, we developed to put the styles separate, right? We separated style from the structure. But we still, many of us, and it's very common, we still put behavioral things like JavaScript in line in our page source. And that is actually not great practice. Um, and when you have inline JavaScript, that is a great weakness with regards to, to cross-site script attacks. So with a CSP, ideally, you will have all of these types of assets externally in an external file, and you will whitelist them. But if, like many of us, your site has been built with inline styles or inline scripts, you can create a content security policy that says, I'm allowing it. So that still means that you have a kind of weakness and a vulnerability there, but it's better than not having any content security policy at all. So this is just, I'm gonna give you some examples of the format. So this is, the basic content security policy directive. And what it's saying is, even if I don't specify for each of those other directives, like fonts, images, whatever, where specifically I'm allowing it to come from, the default will be self, let's say, and let's say HTTPS. You can say, I only allow my site to load assets on it via HTTPS, okay? So you can add other parameters here. And it doesn't have to be this way, but once you've set that, then you don't have to set every other single directive. Here's an example of script source. So this is saying scripts, like JavaScript, can load from self, so from my domain, or Google Analytics, right? We all, even though Google is the big backer of content security policies, their own analytics script, you know, we all embed it straight in the page source. So. Um, we're saying, that's okay, like that can load on my page. Uh, font source, 
also, let's say I'm using Google Fonts, so I say the fonts can load from my own server, from my own domain, and Google Fonts are okay too. We can say never, like in objects, we could say we never want it to load. Um, and now I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about unsafe inline and unsafe eval. So, as I mentioned, you, so eval, bad news in general, um, and inline styles and scripts also but we can authorize them. We can say to the browser, it's okay. But there are some ways to add, even though we're like removing the security of our site by enabling it, we can add some other ways of securing it, specifically on the scripts that we want to load. So um, this is how that content security policy would look if we're saying script source is okay. It's like they, they use phrase, <laughs> phrasing here that doesn't let you think anything other than that you are being unsafe, right? You're saying, browser, I want you to load these unsafe things. It's a very clear message, um, but what can we do? That's just, the internet is a crazy place and we've built our pages in certain ways, so. Um, so one way that you can secure those inline scripts is by adding a nonce, and that would be something that regenerates on every page load and is very complex. And the other way to do it is with a hash. So you create a hash of the script and then if it changes in any way, it won't load. Um, now this, now all of those content security policy things were defensive and they're like not fun. It's, um, you know, creating a content security policy is actually not so easy because you have to make sure that you are not allowing the bad stuff, but you are allowing the stuff that you need for your site to function. You'll have to, do, you end up doing a lot of testing you know, oh, the font's not working, where is it? Oh, I have a YouTube iframe, now it's not working, I have to authorize that. So, but this is a great one that's easy to add and um, I think is very useful and it makes me happy. And it's the upgrade insecure request. So, as we all know, all of our sites should be running on HTTPS and SSL, right? And I'm assuming we've all migrated our sites to that like good web developers. But doing that migration, it's pretty easy to miss something, to miss an asset of some kind that is being loaded on HTTP. Um, you know, it got lost in the rewrite or it's hard coded in the theme files or whatever. By adding this content security policy, it tells the browser, I don't care what the page source says, always load every single asset by HTTPS. And what that means is that you'll always have a green padlock, you will never have mixed content. So that's a really, Nice and easy thing to add. Um, as I said, creating content security policies is not so easy and it can break things. So what you can do is rather than implementing a content security policy and having it become active immediately, you can use the report only function, which will not deliver the content security policy and activate it to your users, your, for your users, but you can look in the developer console of your browser and see what is being blocked by the content security policy as, as if it was active and then modify accordingly. And it can send logs to a URL that you specify, it's in JSON um, format. SRI is something that adds another layer of security to this whole thing, but it's kind of complex. What it does is it says, here's a reference to a script and here's a hash of that script. Now if that script, let's say jQuery, gets updated, then that hash is no longer relevant, do not load this resource. Now, that's not good in the case of a, something that you need and is being automatically updated and they don't notify you, but the point is, in the browse allowed uh, example, their script was modified, if you had SRI enabled, then the hash would no longer match and the script would be clearly different to the browser and it wouldn't have loaded. If you read up on content security policies, you'll see a lot of references to the X types of uh, policies, those are deprecated, they're no longer relevant, there's um, different policies that have taken their place, so just FYI, because you'll come across a lot of content that refers to them. So how to add it? Server level as headers, um, you can add it in your functions. I think this is, in my opinion, the header is the ideal way to do it, um, but a meta tag is really useful because we all can pretty easily add meta tags to our pages. It gives you more control per page, and um, yeah, it's just, yeah, it gives you more like easy control. You can add a meta box to the back end of your site and just manage them from there. 
just note that it doesn't support three of the directives, frame answers, report URI, or sandbox, but those aren't so common. So for most of your use cases, meta tag is fine. Or HT access. Some tools to use to make your CSP journey a little bit easier. Um, the browser console. If you go to the network tab after you've loaded a page, go to the top result, which is your you know, www URL, and you can click through and you can see header information and it will tell you about your content security policy, what it says, etc. This is an easy tool for getting that information. You just plug in your URL and get the results. Google created its own tool, CSB Evaluator. It's kind of funny because what it will do is if you put in um, a URL and it has a CSV, so it will show it to you. It will tell you what it is. It does give you some feedback, which is useful. And if you don't, it just says no CSV. So that's the tool. This is a really useful tool um, created by a guy named Scott Helm. And uh, you plug in your URL and it gives you this kind of report. Now this is an unhappy report. This is actually the White House. That's how many sites don't have content security policies, banks, the White House, you name it, um, they get a big old red F. But it gives you information on what you can improve, and if you have a content security policy, it will analyze that as well. There are some WordPress plugins to help you more easily manage your security headers. So just here are a few security headers, WP Content Security Plugin, HTTP headers, and this is for the SRI, which I managed to check if uh, a script changes. This is an amazing site. Um, it has a lot of tools related to CSPs that you can use that are really, really helpful. Uh, one of my favorites is this, CSP generator. So it can be, you know, I mean, you can do it, but writing your own policies and making sure all the syntax is right and everything, whatever, it's time consuming. So here, you just plug it in. And then at the top, you can see the green is the outputted content security policy, and you've got your policy. Yay, really, really helpful. This is the only tool that I know of that will analyze a page and tell you what you need to whitelist. Um, unfortunately, that's, it's because of the state of content security policies. There aren't that many tools, and this is the only one, and they have a Windows version. Their Mac version is not um, fully fleshed out. But it's very useful because you put a URL in, and it will say to you what you need to put in your content security policy. In terms of adoption across the web for content security policies, um, in February, we were up to 2.4% of the top million sites. So if you guys aren't using content security policies, you're definitely not alone. The point of using a content security policy is not to prevent cross-site scripting. It won't prevent it. But what it does do is if your site is compromised, which um, according to the top security experts, cross-site scripting is one of the most difficult uh, types of attacks to prevent and then deal with and even sometimes know about. Um, when you have a content security policy in place, it's an added level of protection. So it will protect your user even if you've been compromised. To finish off, I want to show you this. So another way to test, an entertaining way to test, if a site has a content security policy um, active, is the script that was created by this guy named Breno De Winter. And you just can plug it into the console. And if the site does not have a content security policy, it will do this. Let's see if this works. Oh, there's no sound. Can you hear it? It's Harlem Shake. Remember Harlem Shake? And if you see at the top, the hamburger icon is dancing. So just, first of all, that music should not be playing. It wouldn't play with you. So it makes the whole site start dancing. Yeah, there's Trump dancing and more dancing. And then, and the White House is dancing, as it should when the Harlem Shake is playing. So that's the kind of fun way to show people that they <laughs> don't have a content security policy active. Um, I think it's something that's worth knowing about. You can protect your users. You can give yourselves an added level of protection. Here are some resources. I'll make the presentation on, uh, available online. Mozilla has amazing resources. And Google, Scott Helm is like an expert. And this other guy, Troy Hunt, yeah, I put him here as well. And um, yeah, let's all make the internet a better place <laughs> with content security policies. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Fantastic. <laughs> we have time for questions. Um, if you have a question, if you're in the back, please stand up so we can actually see you. If you're down here, just raise your hand and Miriam is going to answer your questions. Please also make a questions, not stories or announcements, <laughs> just questions. Thank you. Hi. I have a story to tell. <laughs> just kidding. Um, well, one thing came to my, uh, came to my mind is um, fall positives. What is your experience and is it a daily basis or are there any at all? Thank you. So because it's whitelisted, there aren't false positives, right? Like it's not like that bad thing can get through because only the good things can get through. But what you can end up having is that you're not authorizing things that you need to have. And so this type of reporting where the logs are being sent to the report URI, that can help you keep an eye on things and see if there's something that maybe you didn't authorize and so your page is breaking. You can also check in the console and see if there's, you get these big red errors if something's trying to load and is not allowed. Uh, so it's a, it is something that you kind of need to keep an eye on um, if you change your site quite frequently. But there is no false positive. At the very, at the worst, your font will look weird or the YouTube video on the iframe won't load. You know what I mean? I hope that answered your question. Thank you very much for bringing up CSPs. It's a um, very important topic. I think we are one of those using it for uh, some time now. That's impressive. And thank you very much. Um, <laughs> also impressive bringing it to work in Europe. So, um, no, I just wanted to share a thought about the GDPR context because I think many of us now have the issues having themes or plugins that are doing stuff we don't know about and being not compliant with GDPR. So we were considering using uh, CSPs to prevent any external includes actually because it's oh. quite easy to prevent anything being loaded from external server and thus solving, so from the short time perspective, all the GDPR issues with external contents. Huh, what do you think about it? That's a really interesting application. I've been trying to like ignore GDPR. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be you. <laughs> like I, we like implemented it, but like I was, I left that to our lawyers because my head is spinning from it. And I think it's not clear to almost anyone what exactly we're supposed to be doing. But that's a really interesting approach that is very smart, I think. Like, I think yeah. it's quite radical, but. It is quite radical, but like so GDPR. is GDPR. So, <laughs> in my opinion. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That was a good story. <laughs> okay, that was the only story, though. <laughs> Can we have more questions? Any, anyone have more questions? Don't be shy. Yeah, right there. Hello. Um, good talk, thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to earlier when you mentioned about unsafe inline. And yeah. I went through a period about a month ago where I was going through a lot of these things and trying to update my own content security policy and going through a lot of pitfalls. So it's interesting to see what you've done, but I also noticed that I also try to remove unsafe inline and unsafe eval. And although a lot of the code that I'd written was fine, there was parts of WordPress that didn't necessarily like what I'd done. Sorry, I'll stand up so people can see where I am. Um, for example, the thing that I noticed first was that Yoast SEO stopped working, and oh. when I dug further into that, as well as that, the media page stopped working and the media library did. It turns out that there's something in Backbone that compiles functions by creating a fun oh. compiles templates by creating right. a function which gets blocked by those consistent security policies. Do you have anything you can recommend to mitigate or? Yeah, so um, you need to have the content security policy not be applied to the admin area, which there's ways to do that. And then the plugins will work because the output, let's say of Yoast, right? It's meta, whatever, it's, it's just data. So that's fine because it's not actually scripts. The scripts are on the admin side. So you need to not have the CSP applying to the admin area. Um, in my opinion. Um, I think though in general about unsafe inline and unsafe eval, just like it took a while for everyone to move their CSS to external files, I think when people start to become aware of the security implications, then hopefully we as developers will start to build sites differently and make sure that the assets are externalized in separate files and, 
and then we'll be able to start stop using unsafe um, in line and unsafe eval in our content security policies. But I think that's going to be a while. And you know, Google, I really feel like they're to blame. Like sometimes in their speed um, suggestions, they'll say inline things because we'll make it faster, and then they're like, don't inline things because then you have security issues. Well. The internet's a mess because of these types of things. So in the meantime, I think we're all going to be using it, and not much we can do about it. All right, we do have a question in the first row over here. If we have any more, if you're in the back, please stand up so we can see you. Um, so what you just mentioned with the unsafe inline, um, currently in WordPress, all the translation for JavaScript are done by inlining the an object. Um, do you know of any of the plugins you mentioned that's using nonces to those inlines? No. No. Like almost no one. Like really, if you think about it, how like two percent of the internet is using it. If they're using it, they're not using it necessarily in an optimum fashion, and it's it's barely being used. Maybe the WordPress community needs to consider these types of things. I feel like the SRI could be something relevant to WordPress because one of the problems with SRI is that you need to be able to notify the users that there's an update to a library or something in order for them to redo, regenerate the hash, whereas yeah. that could actually be built in, theoretically, to, to, the, to WordPress because we all get updates pushed to us. So I don't know. Yeah, because I don't see a, a, a good alternative to this current solution on how to translate JavaScript. Yeah. without inlining JavaScript into the right. website. Right, I mean, I think that's going to be the case with a lot of things, like I said, for the foreseeable future, but maybe implementing nonce or, or hashes could help mitigate it for the, in the meantime. Any more questions? We have time for one or two more. Don't be shy, it's right there. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, regarding the, the inline uh, JavaScript and so on, uh, I'm not an expert, okay? But uh, Vue.js does a lot of inlining and works with the injecting the, the content inline. Oh. Um, to build the components and so on and so on and so on. But I never felt it as a security issue because all the properties are hidden, right? Right. Uh, do you feel it like uh, being in uh, a problem with you? I mean, I'm not familiar with you yeah. very much, right? And I would hate to say that an entire thing should change <laughs> the way that they're doing things. I, I, I'm a small person, I don't know. But if they've done it that way, it's yet another sign of people, including myself, only like in the last six months did I start to really learn about content security policies. People just aren't aware that it's a security issue. And what can I say? Google is saying, make sure to offset all of your, externalize your, your resources. So depending on how Vue is configured, maybe they should too, but I don't know. I hate to, to I, can't, I can't say. I'll have a look. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, do we have one last question? One last one, now's your time. It is now or never. Okay, if not, we're just gonna close this question and answers. And uh, Miriam, how can people reach out to you? I see an email address up there. Miriam at stratic.com. Feel free to email me. I'd love to talk about content security policies because nobody's talking about it. <laughs> so All we right. can have a conversation. <laughs> All right, people, please give it up for Miriam Schwab. Thanks, enjoy your lunch and the rest of the conference.